Shalom. Shalom. Peace. Assalamu alaikum. So, uh, in the eight minutes, I don't know how to find that. Uh, I'll talk about two things, actually three things, mercy and grace and forgiveness. The very first verse in the Quran it reads, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. That's the very first verse. It is not out of revelation, but as you open the Quran, the very first verse, and that's the first verse of the open chapter called opening or Al Fatiha. In there, there are two words which are the two of the attributes of God Almighty, Allah. And it says, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. I begin in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. So two names, Ar Rahman and Ar Rahim, translated most gracious, most merciful. And then the third verse in the same opening or uh, Al Fatiha, it says, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. So it's emphasizing those two things which came from it. God Almighty uh, Allah is known in, uh, among Muslims and in the Quran by 99 names. They are beautiful names and repeated most often to the pages of the Quran in various verses. So Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim are two of those 99 names. This uh, just demonstrate that Allah mercy and kindness and compassion and forgiveness towards something like that? No, switch microphones. Someone texted me who's watching on streaming, so they said they can't hear you, so if you switch microphones, that I know there's something not right. <laughs> <laughs> so demonstrate to us. Uh, we should switch microphones, which uh, help us with that. Yeah. Couldn't hear anything. Help us which microphone. He just didn't hear yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's okay. Okay. So those two, two names or two attributes of God Almighty, Allah, demonstrate to the creatures, you, me, and all living beings, that God Almighty is kind, considerate, loving. So now, the actual meaning, Ar Rahman, there's also a one whole chapter, chapter 55 in the Quran, which start the name of the chapter is Ar Rahman, talking about Allah, and it begins Ar Rahman, Allah al Quran. The, the Ar Rahman, that Allah has guided us with the Quran. So now, the two words used Ar Rahman Ar Rahim for mercy. And the last one, Ar Rahim, is a comparative term used in comparing, with comparing Allah's mercy, <laughs> kindness, with other beings, like for example, my parents, my spouse, my children, the people I love, people I work with, and even those who may be benefiting me some way or the other, maybe my employer. And so it says Ar Rahim that Allah, its mercies is better than anybody you come in contact with. And it is not weighted and it is not measured, it is not a granted of this amount or that amount, it is enormous and open-ended. So it translated in English of Rahim as a most merciful. When we turn to Allah and you will find boundless mercy which is far better than any other being can provide for us. And we have the other story of Ibrahim, Abraham's in the Quran, it talks about that he, when he was born in the house of idol maker and then start challenging from his childhood that what are you making? And then he didn't know at that time that who is the Lord. So he challenged himself and finally he concluded that these things that you see around ourselves, these things which looks like it brightened the day, they are all eventually gone. The sun sets, the moon sets, the trees 
lose it, uh, leaves, so they cannot give me anything. And then I know my father is making this idol that people worship. What good they are to me? So he turns to the mercy of God Almighty. The second term which is used are Rahman. A Rahman actually uh, in Arabic we say Mubadala. That it is telling that it has no limit. The, the Rahim or mercy, the most merciful has a limitation because comparison to some, some other being. But a Rahman has no limit. In other words, some of the writers, the scholars have said that means also source of mercy. It has like a powerhouse of mercy. And God Almighty says in the Quran, that God Almighty will be so kind to us that it will take us out of the darkness into light or from ignorance into enlightenment. The, the root words for that is Arham. That is also meaning womb. So how we are comfortable with the womb of our mother, that's how we'll be or better in, in, in with Rahman or Ar Rahman. In the Quran, these words, grace and mercy, is repeated 171 times. It tells us that importance and significance of this word because every time the God Almighty repeats something, that means God emphasizing the mercy, kindness, consideration. And forgiveness is repeated 234 times more than the mercy. But forgiveness is also a mercy of God. It is not something outside of the mercy of God. And then God Almighty also talks about Quran itself as a one that we have sent down Quran as healing and a mercy for the believers. And then in the as talking about the Quran, Allah also says that Ramadan Quran that I have revealed this Quran in the month of Ramadan as guidance for humanity. And that itself is also a kindness and mercy of consideration of God Almighty. And Prophet Muhammad is also called Wama Salnaka God says, We have not sent you but as mercy to all. And one point in one of the battles uh, with the uh, pagans, when Muslims lost, they lost because Prophet Muhammad has consulted with the people and they advised him. And he followed the advice and they lost. So he was kind of a little bit, he thought he a setback because he listened to these people. The God reminded him that be kind to them and consult with them again, even though you lost it. But you still be kind to them and listen to them and, and consult with them when you're making a decision. So forgiveness is a very important aspect in, in Islam and in the nature of Allah. And it says that uh, God Almighty will forgive anything and everything. And God is sitting there for the asking. If you ask, God will forgive you. So we have to take the first step. That we ask and God will forgive. Anything is small or big. Then there are some rules, of course, that we have to be sincere asking for forgiveness. And then we have to amend ourselves and not keep doing the same thing. And God says, you know, it's okay. It's okay. And I return to me and I will forgive you. It's also a process that Muslims follow that after every time we pray, at the end of the prayer we say Istighfar. It's a prayer for asking Allah to forgive us. Every time. And God Almighty says, you know, when you turn to me, I'll turn to you. You ask me, I'll grant. In case of forgiveness, there's a two 
attributes of God Almighty also mentioned. Number one is the fool. That means the one who forgives. Another one, the far, which is also Mubalaga, that is it has no limit. That God Almighty will forgive you over and over and over and over and every time you turn to God and forgive you. The only thing God will not forgive is shift. And shift means that when we associating any other power or authority with God Almighty, they're taking God before God Almighty. But even then, God says, will forgive, because if you turn in, 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 for, in seeking God's forgiveness and turn and surrender to God, then God will forgive them also. There's a various things happen in, in Muslim life that uh, when we pray sincerely five times a day, every time God forgives everything we have done from one prayer to the other prayer. So like we have a clean slate. When we, during month of Ramadan, we're fasting, God forgives us. Then again, at the end of Ramadan, we have like a clean slate. And those who have the opportunity to go perform pilgrimage to Mecca, to Hajj, walking in the footstep of Hagar, and reviving the tradition of Abraham, when they come back, they are forgiving and they are like newborn baby. The for forgiveness is big. So I will stop here and then we will talk some. I have one here. Just make sure you're holding it really close. Really close. I think I'm going to use Thank you for providing. Thank you for your remarks. So, Rabbi, this is on. Yes. Right? Okay. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. So, I'm honored to be here this evening. I am going to read what I've written here, and uh, it's not actually my normal style, but in honor of the rabbi who made this invitation. I feel like that's appropriate for this occasion. Anyway, I'm honored to be here and grateful to uh, Rabbi Fishman for the invitation to speak with my uh, clergy colleagues, right and left, on the threshold of the Jewish days of awe. Now, the way I heard these days is the days of awe and wonder. But uh, one of my rabbi friends said, no, it's the days of awe but it's perfectly appropriate, appropriate to add wonder. So, you can have that. But I, I, I always add wonder. Some of you may know that the Los Angeles Dodgers are in town. And uh, so while you are, were enjoying your Shabbat, I was at the game last night. <laughs> and I couldn't help but think of the great Sandy Koufax that uh, some of you may know who uh, famously refused to pitch on Yom Kippur. And uh, when I was a young child and a huge baseball fan, as I am now, that had a uh, living in the Deep South where there was one Jewish family in my town on the Panhandle of Florida. Uh, the, the, what we would, in our tradition, we call the witness. The witness of Sandy Koufax to his tradition and the refusal to pitch on Yom Kippur uh, really re actually had a very profound impact on me. And, um, remain grateful to him, though I'm disappointed that he quit so early and then never became a coach or a commentator or anything else. But uh, anyway, so everything that I have to say is really in honor of and in gratitude to Sandy Cope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, though, though I hope that uh, the, the Dodgers lose tomorrow, I do honor the, the, the life of Sandy Koufax. So my task, as it's been given to me, is to speak about grace and forgiveness from a distinctive Christian perspective. I can't speak for my esteemed colleague, but preachers are often long-winded, and so uh, I know our time together is brief, and so I'm going to endeavor to be short-winded and as concise as possible with such a large topic as grace and forgiveness. <clears throat> 
So I'm going to begin by just saying that our scriptures teach us that God is gracious, whose steadfast love endures forever, the Psalms teach us. The Christian tradition teaches that God, this God, the Holy One of Israel, sent His Son Jesus, who was a Jew, from Nazareth to be the embodiment of God's forgiveness. God's steadfast love was embodied in the body of Jesus, the Jew from Nazareth. This is what Christians believe. His purpose, that is Jesus' purpose, was to restore fallen humanity to a relationship with God in keeping with the Hebrew scriptures. This embodied love even took upon death on a cross. So Christians believe that in the cross of Jesus is revealed the extent of God's love for the entire humanity. And the radical forgiveness of God is actually made visible in death. And in the resurrection of the body of of Jesus the Jew from Nazareth. The heart of Christian faith is that God is gracious and from this grace, which we understand as gift, it's got gift and grace are synonymous. So from this gift that's visible in the body of Jesus flows forgiveness for the sins of all of humanity that has fallen away from the goodness and the grace and the love of God from the beginning. Humanity fell away, God said, I'll make another way. So Christians enact this belief in our weekly worship in a communal confession of sin. We actually say that every week. Um, we repeat these lines of scripture, our scripture. If we say that we have no sin, then we are self-deceived and strangers to the truth. But if we confess that we have fallen away from God, then God, who is always faithful and just, will forgive us and will restore us to righteousness that comes from God. Which is to say, every Sunday morning, which I'll be there tomorrow morning, we name our sins. And we follow that by hearing an assurance that God's steadfast love and mercy is eternal. And then we greet one another with signs of peace. In some traditions, it's a kiss of peace. Other traditions, it's a handshake. Others, it's a hug, for varieties of ways of acknowledging that God's steadfast love and mercy endures forever. So, simply put, this is the Christian proclamation that forgiveness flows from the gracious gift of the steadfast love of God. And that forgiveness mirror, mirrors, reflects, God's action toward all of humanity, <coughs> all of it, in that is made most visible in Jesus, the Jew from Nazareth, who died and was raised from the dead. What we believe, therefore, is that Christians and all others are set free to forgive others, and that that becomes our entire um, um, a call, vocation. Which leads me to a story from the New Testament which illustrates this spiritual practice that, that's at the heart of Christianity. We think of it as a practice, forgiveness. It's a scripture reading that, ironically, I think it's ironic, I, you know, it's our reading for tomorrow. <laughs> or tomorrow morning's reading in which Peter Peter asked his rabbi, Jesus, Rabbi, how often should I forgive? Seven times? And there are some scholars who think seven is the number for perfection. 
So Peter says to Rabbi, Rabbi Jesus, seven times? And Rabbi Jesus responds, not seven times shall you forgive your neighbor, but 70 times seven, which is a traditional Jewish rhetorical device to indicate the practice of forgiveness actually asks, lasts for a lifetime. <coughs> So, since we're on the threshold of the days of awe, it's also important for me to note repentance. Repentance, the act of turning in a new direction, which you all are on the threshold of, for us is coupled with forgiveness. The two go hand in hand. You cannot separate them. Yet what makes the Christian understanding of grace so radical is that repentance is actually the fruit of forgiveness rather than the condition that allows for forgiveness. The radical act of forgiveness by God that's once accepted is what generates then a change in a person's being, in a person's heart, in a moral practice in the one that's forgiven. Jesus' followers, therefore, once they have been radically transformed from the inside, are to display this act of God in their relations with everyone else. No one would ever say it's easy, but it's what we are called to do. When I say we, I say I'm, I'm, I'm speaking about the Christian tradition. No one ever says anything about forgiveness is easy, but we are called to do it because we believe that God did it for us, and therefore we will do it. So I want to end now with a story from the 5th century. The 5th century was a time when many Christians fled into the Egyptian desert. And they went out into the desert because they were seeking a place of solitude, solitariness, to pray far from what they perceived to be the kind of spiritual and cultural, moral insanity of the culture that they were in. So these folks, they went out into the desert they created kind of monastic communities, and then they developed a tradition of stories that's very similar to the uh, uh, to Hasidic stories, actually. And they're called the Desert Wisdom, stories from the wisdom of the desert. In one of these stories, one that I love the most, a brother uh, commits a sin. It's unnamed, but it's a sin of some sort. And the elders then call for the venerable abbot, and you might substitute uh, the imam, the rabbi, whatever, to come and pronounce judgment upon the fallen sinner. But the abbot refuses to go, and so the elders uh, persist. The abbot refuses, the elders persist. So finally he gets up to go, and he takes a basket with holes, fills it with sand, and carries it with him. And the people come running out to meet him with wonder in their eyes, and they say to him, What is this, Father? And the old man says to him, My sins are running out behind me, and I cannot see them. And you're calling upon me to judge another? And when they heard him say this, they said to the brother, you're forgiven. Go your way. Thank you. Amen. <clears throat> Welcome to Iman Ali and to Pastor Howard. Uh, we did not compare notes beforehand, but I hope you're hearing and you will hear important similarities between the, among the three presentations. And of course, there are some differences. Uh, one thing that Pastor Howard and I have in common in our house, when our older son became bar mitzvah, one of the gifts he received was a photograph 
of Sandy Koufax Kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> and although he doesn't live in our house anymore, he was recently married, um, he understands that that photograph does not convey it stays in our house. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't There is one strand of rabbinic thought going back to the late first century, well, let's say mid first century of the coming era, that suggests that God will redeem us for God's sake, not because we deserve to be redeemed. To me, this suggests that God is always ready to forgive graciously without regard for the human component. If you're interested in the reference, it's the Babylonian Talmud, the Tractate Sanhedrin, page 97b to 98a. The teachers are first century teachers, and I wonder, and I'll ask this question aloud, whether this was a point of view in the air when Jesus lived. Perhaps there is some connection there. There is a mistaken notion of God, the God specifically of the Hebrew Bible, that God is vengeful, not loving or caring of humanity, and interested in the fall of innate, innately, inherently sinful human beings. Let me see how many holes I can shoot in that presentation. It does appear, and I think Jewish tradition defends this notion, following notion, that sin is a part and a fact is part of the fabric of the biblical narrative, starting from Adam and Eve. But Judaism does not see human beings as fallen or as inherently sinful. We don't accept the notion of original sin. And there is a verse in Genesis which suggests that we are sinful or our thoughts are sinful from our youth, but not innately. And commentaries suggest, commentators suggest that Eden, Garden of Eden, was not intended to be the stage on which human life would play out. Perhaps it's an ideal stage, but not where human, being, human beings would act, not where human history would take place. Human life admits sin and therefore raises the question of God's reaction to sin. And you've heard two reactions or two presentations about God's reaction to sin already this evening. Is God punitive? Is God long-suffering? Can humans approach God after transgressing? After transgressing? And an ancillary, ancillary question would be, how do we understand what the word sin means? Is it, as many suggest, you aim at a target and you miss the target? And that notion does not suggest, imply, admit what many people think is part of Jewish tradition, that with sin comes guilt. And there are many, especially 20th, 20th century Jewish comedians, who traded on that notion over and again. It's not something I'm going to emphasize, or even I think not something that I think deserves a great deal of attention. The biblical text that's instructive for these matters is the response of Moses and God to the golden calf built almost, let's say, shortly after the experience of God at Mount Sinai. The biblical reference is Exodus chapter 34, verses 4 to 7, and specifically verses 6 and 7. Moses is pleading on behalf of the people for their well-being, and this is what the text says. So Moses carved two tablets of stone, like the first, and early in the morning he went up on Sinai. The Lord came down in a cloud. The Lord stood with him there and proclaimed the name Lord. The Lord passed before him, and the Lord proclaimed, and these are the key words, the Lord, the Lord, a God compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in kindness and faithfulness, extending kindness to the, to the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet the Lord does not remit all punishment, 
but visits the iniquity of parents upon children and children's children upon the third and fourth generations. I'm not going to concentrate on visits the iniquity of parents upon children and children's children upon the third and fourth generations. That deserves a separate slichot night. Maybe we'll do that some other time. But I want to concentrate on the earlier part of those verses. And how the Jews read these verses. In fact, we declaim this passage especially on Yom Kippur. We <coughs> emphasize God's capacity to forgive, to accept human frailty. These are God's attributes of compassion. Is this amnesty after transgression? I'll leave that to you to decide. And in a connected question, how is God affected by sin, if at all? In this season, we concentrate on Teshuvah, returning. And in fact, we will read a passage which sounds very much like what Imam Ali mentioned before. Shuvu Elai Vashuva Alechem. You turn to me, and I will turn to you. Given these verses from Exodus, do we need to concentrate on these ideas of teshuvah, of kapara, atonement, and slicha, and forgiveness? First, let's focus on the first two words in the verses I quoted. The first two words are identical. The Lord, the Lord. And if you're a good commentator, and a careful reader of biblical texts, you can ask a very direct question. Why repeat the name of God? Lord, who said it once. Or even it's God who's saying it. Why must that name be repeated? And traditional rabbinic interpretation says the following. This name of God appears twice because it refers to two different kinds of God's mercy. The first is that God is merciful before an individual sins even though God knows that in the future there is evil lying before this individual. Or as one commentator suggests, God is merciful even to people who while they may not have sinned, they have not earned God's mercy with good deeds. So we're getting a little bit more complex in this interpretation. That's the first name of the Lord there. And why mention Lord a second time? Suggests that even after someone has sinned, God mercifully accepts him or her through tshuva. But note the importance of human move closer to God after moving away from God through sin. Without God's mercy, a sin could not simply disappear from the scales of justice based on the sinner's repentance alone. Now, a rabbinic interpretation of the other attributes of compassion will, I hope, be add to this presentation. We saw God's name repeated twice, Lord, Lord, and then another name of God, El, God, a name which denotes power, and in the context of these attributes of compassion, it is a degree of mercy, commentators say, that surpasses even that those degrees of mercy already indicated. And then we say God is compassionate, understood as God eases the punishment of the guilty and helps people avoid temptation. And God is gracious, understood as God is gracious even to those who are undeserving. And God is slow to anger with both the righteous and the sinful. God is patient. Punishment is deferred, giving all of us time to reflect, improve, and repent. And God is abundant in kindness, even to those who lack personal merits. Let's imagine that the scales are completely balanced, 50-50, positive and negative. God is abundant in kindness. It's understood that God tips the scale of judgment toward the good. 
And I said before, and I'll repeat, that God does not remit all punishment. And the next statement is, and God cleanses, but does not cleanse. Nake, lo yinake, if you remember the Hebrew text. How is that possible? When someone repents, God cleanses that person of sin, so that the effect of the sin vanishes. However, if one does not repent, God does not cleanse. There is always that human role in this calculus. And one commentator added, God cleanses fully those who repent out of love. Those who repent out of fear of retribution receive a partial cleansing. These rabbinic interpretations create God's personality, if I can use that term, as well as a human personality. God knows sin will occur. God remains God despite sin, which means God is always patient, slow to exact punishment. God softens punishment of the guilty. And like a good social worker, God keeps humans from temptation and keeps the proverbial door open to the penitent. So we have, as part of God's personality, God is a loving social worker, God is a loving parent, etc. And what about the human personality? Humans have the potential to reflect, to recalibrate, and restore the relationship with God by turning. That's what Teshuvah means. Imagine we're standing on points on the circumference of a circle. Helen was here at a class that I which I mentioned this earlier this week. Teshuvah means turning in toward God who is at the center of that circle. We live with the belief that God keeps the door open and that we can always knock, enter, and resume the, the loving relationship with God. Thanks a lot.